Thank you uh, very much for the uh, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to uh, be here remotely. Of course, it would be even more fun uh, to be there with all of you in person. But uh, things being what they are, uh, you know, this will have to suffice. Uh, let me say, for starters, that uh, you know this uh, these lectures are really for you folks, uh, and it's very hard for me to uh, to resolve you in this little picture at the bottom of the screen. So uh, please do uh, feel free to yell and scream and shout and wave your hands, um, uh, or uh, ask one of your hosts there as you prefer. Uh, if you have questions, uh, I think the uh, the dialogue is really uh, what makes this valuable. Okay, um, so what I'm gonna tell you uh, about today uh, and in the next two days are sort of uh, ongoing works uh, in my group and around the world exploring uh, uh, topology and topological physics and quantum optics. Um, so, uh, let me just start by giving you a little bit of a flavor of how I would like to tell this story. Um, so this is kind of a joke, but, uh, but the real point is the following. Um, I, I'm going to try to give you an introduction uh, to topological physics writ large with examples drawn specifically from quantum optics. Um, and so what you're going to find is that the level of complexity is really going to go up and down. Um, and so you should feel free to ask questions as you go along, but, but also don't really feel like you have to understand everything uh, to be able to, uh, to move forward into the, uh, the later bits of this uh, sort of tutorial lecture. Uh, the, the more technical bits, uh, particularly today that I'm including, uh, are more for your reference um, than for uh, really uh, building an understanding. And, and so they shouldn't really be required uh, going forward. Okay, so, so how is this uh, tutorial gonna be organized? Um, so today I just wanna give you a flavor of uh, topology, uh, topology in other fields, how is it connected to physics? Uh, I wanna give you a sense of uh, uh, how one should think about particles in magnetic fields and the continuum and lattices, a very brief flavor of what a churn number is. Really the point is just to get a sense of this smorgasbord of kind of relevant ideas and build some common language, okay? Um, tomorrow we're gonna talk about how to realize some of this topological physics uh, in circuit models. Um, and uh, so we'll start by talking about linear physics uh, and how to implement various uh, topological materials uh, where the particles don't interact with each other. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about adding interactions. Um, and then on Wednesday, we're gonna focus on the fractional quantum Hall effect. So I'll give you a brief introduction to that physics. Um, and then talk about studying it in uh, twisted optical resonators and with Rydberg polaritons. Okay? So, um, our topic for today is topology. Um, so, uh, I don't think we really need to talk about all of this at the beginning. Um, topology means a lot of different things uh, to a lot of different people. Uh, to me, the definition which is most relevant is this first one from mathematics, uh, the study of geometric properties in spatial relations, unaffected by continuous change of shape uh, or size of figures. So that's pretty vague. Uh, the place to start here uh, is to uh, look at uh, these pastries and ask which one is different. Okay, so you might be inclined to say that uh, the one that I've highlighted is different because it's not chocolate. Um, and you wouldn't be wrong. Um, alternatively, you might uh, notice that the one in the upper left is actually a pumpernickel bagel, um, which is not dessert. So that one is also different. Um, but in fact, what I'm most interested in is, uh, is the, the, the one in the lower left, uh, which is not a torus. So this is meant sort of in jest, but, but I feel like there's a, a pretty important point here, which is to say the first two are rather subjective, 
okay? In the sense that the, uh, this vanilla frosted one does have some chocolate on it, right? So how much chocolate frosting do you have to have for something to be chocolate, okay? Similarly, how much sugar does the bagel have to have to be considered a dessert? Um, so, you know, I'm kind of saying this in jest, but the real point is the following. Um, asking whether or not the thing is a tourist doesn't give you any information about how delicious it is, right? But it does tell you, it is something that has sort of a yes, no answer, okay? Um, and so from the perspective of studying phase transitions or studying materials, these sorts of things, we really like yes, no answers, right? Um, and, and indeed, from the perspective of building quantum computers, we like things that have some protection from being wrong, okay? They're, they're robust, um, rather than sort of continuous quantities like the amount of chocolate, okay? So this is a little bit silly, but uh, I really would like to push this analogy uh, quite a bit further, in fact. So um, what does it mean for something to be a donut? I would say a donut is any object with one hole, and I will use the terms hole and handle interchangeably going forward today, okay? So this is a donut, whether or not you like sprinkles, okay? So, oh, these are in the wrong order. That's too bad. Um, so the real question, this one is of course, obviously a donut. This one is obviously not a donut. This is a donut. But then you can say, well, that's really a pretzel. But, you know, in shape, it's a donut. Is this a donut? Well, it has three holes. So this is not a donut. Okay, what about this one? This one, we've made the surface rough. But it still has one hole. So it's still a donut. Now we get to some that are kind of interesting. Is that still a donut? Well, it's got one hole. So it's still a donut. Great. What about that one? Well, I mean, once someone has eaten enough of your donut, you maybe don't want to eat it anymore. But I would say that, in fact, this one is not a donut. This one is a sphere. Okay? Um, and you might say that, that, that you know, I, I'm not, I don't see so well. But, but we'll talk about why it's a sphere in a little while. It's clearly not a donut. It doesn't have a hole. Okay? Um, what about these two? Are they donuts? Well, you can kind of see that if you untwisted them, the ends are connected to each other, right? Uh, so in fact, that's two donuts. Um, and, um, and what about uh, what I'm showing, what I'm going to show you under this um, blue thing, you, the idea would be to say when you can tell that it's a donut. And the interesting point is, as I move that blue cover off of the donut, it's not until you can see the entire thing that you can tell me whether it's a donut or not, right? Because it could be bitten through or it could have two holes. There could be all kinds of problems. You need to see the entirety of the object uh, to know if it's a donut. And indeed, what we can say is that this coffee cup is also a donut. That was supposed to be the last one, but I'm apparently not very good uh, with Kino um, because it has one hole in it here. Um, okay, so, now we can ask about um, sort of more mathematically formally, what does it mean to be a donut? Uh, and the point at some level is some things you can tell if they're a donut or not, right? You could look at those objects and, um, and you could see that they have one hole, right? And that makes it a donut, right? Uh, but maybe you have so many donuts that you don't want to have to have a person characterize them, you would like to have a machine do it, right? Or perhaps you have a more complicated surface uh, so that it's a little harder to tell if it's a donut or not, okay? Um, and so what I'd like to do is define this quantity called the Euler characteristic, okay? Which is the integral of the Gaussian curvature over a closed surface uh, divided by two pi. And the Gaussian curvature at a point on a surface is basically one over the product of the two radii of curvature of the surface at that, at that point, which is to say, fit the surface to a sphere or to an ellipsoid, and what are the two principal radii of that ellipsoid, 
Okay, so now we have an interesting theorem, which states that this quantity chi, which is an integral over the whole surface, is equal to two times one minus the number of holes in the surface. Okay, and and you can smoothly deform the surface as much as you want, and it doesn't change the answer. So. Um, this is the, uh, the central theorem, I would say, in, in some sense, for, uh, for, for closed surface topology. And we can think about a sphere here and, and see what the answer is, okay? So if I have a sphere um, of radius r, then the local radius of curvature is everywhere uh, 1 over r, r squared, excuse me. So I can just perform this integral uh, by fiat, okay? 1 over 2 pi. The integral dA is just the surface area. That's 4 pi r squared. And that curvature k is 1 over r squared. So I just get 2, OK? And indeed, if, if chi is 2, that means that the sphere has 0 handles. And spheres don't have any holes in them. So that works out great. It's a little trickier to compute for a torus. The, uh, the basic challenge there is that if you think about a torus, uh, on the inner edges, it, uh, one of the radii of curvature is negative and the other one is positive, okay? Which means that this local curvature in total is negative there because it's the product of a negative number and a positive number. But on the outer surface of the torus, we have a curvature of, uh, uh, that's, that's positive for both axes. And what you find is that these two things just cancel out. Okay, uh, and, and this gives us a total uh, Euler characteristic of zero, which is more or less what we expect um, because a torus has one handle. In fact, these uh, headphones are giving me a headache, so let me remove them. Uh, can, you, can everyone still hear me? Yes, good. All right, um, so. I would say the, the easier way to get some intuition about what's going on here is to instead think about polyhedra, okay? And this, I think, is a really beautiful result, okay? I can make a, uh, a surface, a closed surface, out of polyhedra instead of making it smooth, okay? And uh, the Euler characteristic for that smooth surface is the number of vertices minus the number of edges, plus the number of faces. And this Gauss-Bonnet theorem says that that's equal to 2 times 1 minus the number of handles, once again. OK? So we can start by looking at a cube. A cube has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 vertices. OK? How many edges does it have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 edges and six faces. So chi equals two, a cube is a sphere, right? No handles. Now we can look at our uh, discrete version of a donut. Uh, this one doesn't have any sprinkles, but that doesn't make it any less good. Um, and so you can again go through and, and count uh, vertices and edges. Uh, and what you'll see is it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, times two is 16 vertices. 32 edges and 16 faces. So, so chi equals zero. So again, this thing has one handle. You can reach through it. It's got one hole. Okay. Um, but the question a little bit is, you know, what's going on here? Why is this the case? Uh, and we can understand this, I think, in a pretty cool way. The basic idea is that you take this original sphere, okay, and uh, we know what it's, uh, uh, what its Euler characteristic is. And so the question is, what happens if I tessellate one of the faces, right? Because remember, I can sort of make any shape I want, either by deforming the faces, by moving the points around, which clearly doesn't change the number of vertices, edges, or faces, or by tessellating the faces, adding points in the middle of the faces, okay? So if I add one point somewhere in the middle of one of these faces, well, I've added one more vertex, right? I've added four more edges, and I have four faces here where I previously had one, so I've added three more faces, okay? Which means that 
when you add one minus four plus three here, you haven't changed this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, Euler characteristic. You haven't changed um, uh, the, the value. So tessellation doesn't change the Euler characteristic. That's really cool, right? And of course, we know that moving the points around doesn't change the Euler characteristic. It doesn't change the connectivity, so it can't. Um, so, so continuously deforming the shape doesn't change this Euler characteristic. But then the interesting question is, what happens if I punch a hole and then fix the connections? Okay? So I have my sphere. I've sort of tessellated and deformed it so that it's still a sphere, but I'm sort of slowly squeezing it towards this donut. Okay? So this deformed one, we clearly haven't changed the Euler characteristic based on what we computed before. Okay? But what happens if I remove this surface and the surface below and then connect these edges? Okay? That adds no more vertices to the system, but it adds one, two, three, four new edges right? And how many new faces? Well, previously I had one top face and one bottom face, and now I've added two additional faces. I have one, two, three, four here, but I got rid of two, so I have two additional faces, right? So that means that when I punch a hole through this object, what happens is I add four edges, but only two faces, and hence I change the Euler characteristic by two. Right? So every time I add a handle or add a hole, I change the Euler characteristic by two. And I hope this is kind of giving you a flavor uh, fundamentally of what's going on here. There are sort of two different ingredients that matter. Okay, Ingredient number one is you need to have a quantity that continuous deformations don't change at all. Okay, And then ingredient number two is you need to have a quantity that these sort of discrete deformations where I, I punch a hole, well, that removes two faces and adds four faces, but it adds four edges. And so that changes this thing a discrete amount. Okay? And if you have those two ingredients, this is sort of something that can topologically characterize uh, your system. Okay? Um, and so this is more or less what happens to the donut as well, incidentally. If I were to cut through this surface over here at this point, what would I do? I would add no more faces, or excuse me, no more vertices, right? I would add two more faces and four more edges. Or excuse me, four more edges, or how does this go? Let's be careful. If I cut this in half, I would get one, two, three, four there, five, six, seven, eight more edges and two more faces. Um, and so this then goes back to being a sphere. Okay, uh, and so that's what happens when you bite through your donut. So uh, just, just to be clear, there are many examples of topology uh, throughout science. And the point in general is continuous deformation is OK. Discrete deformation changes some, uh, some quantized number. OK, so you can have a loop of string like this. And uh, there's no way to continuously deform it into this knot. You have to sort of bring the string through itself to generate the knot. OK. Um, and so one can generate such, a, such an Euler character, something like an Euler characteristic here. Uh, the important points, though, are sort of twofold. One is that you can't tell whether this string is knotted or not without examining the entire string. Okay? This uh, topology is not a local feature. So I really didn't like that in that definition they use the word geometry. Right? Geometry is a local feature. Topology is a global feature. And so the idea is you can modify your local geometry, but that doesn't change the topology necessarily unless you go through a sort of violent discrete jump. Okay? 
Um, uh, let me just point out briefly what we conventionally call a knot, right? Like what I've got in my shoelaces here um, is, is topologically trivial. Um, and, and we know this because uh, you can tie your shoes in a knot without cutting them, right? Uh, the, the point being the ends of your shoelaces are not attached to each other. Um, so as a consequence, um, you know, all of the uh, knots you make in your shoelaces are topologically equivalent. Um, so my boss has showed up. I need to introduce you to uh, Emmy the cat. Um, you'll see her periodically through these lectures. She's just making sure everything is correct. She's, she's named for Emmy Noether because she likes to look at herself in the mirror. And I know that's a discrete, not a continuous symmetry, but she's a cat, give her a break. Okay. So what does any of this have to do with physics or particles and magnetic fields? So uh, again, what we're gonna try to do is motivate these ideas qualitatively. I'll give you some of the more quantitative answers, but we're not gonna prove them, okay? So if I put an electron in a magnetic field, I get uh, nice little circular cyclotron orbits, okay? Uh, and the frequency of those orbits is EB over M, regardless of what the velocity uh, or hence orbital radius of the particle is. Um, and this is important on, for, for, for later lectures, but the really important thing is that I get these nice little circular orbits. Now, what if I have a wall? Well, if I have a wall, my particle tries to undergo a circular orbit, but it bounces off the wall. And when it bounces off the wall, it comes straight back out and then gets bent again in the same direction and just sort of moves along the wall, okay? So the point is, in the bulk of such a material with electrons, the electrons will move in little circles in the bulk. They'll kind of be insulators. And on the edge, they'll skip along, okay? So why is that um, a useful thing? Well, the interesting fact is, if I have disorder on the edge of this system, the electrons can't scatter and go backwards, okay? What they do, because of the chirality of their orbits set by the direction of the magnetic field, okay, they will bounce around the disorder and just keep going, okay? And, and so here's the interesting point. If I have a finite size piece of material, then kind of in the bulk, I get these nice little circular orbits. I guess the circle should go this way for what I'm gonna do next. And then along the edge, I get these skipping orbits, okay? That eventually close back on themselves. So here's the really interesting point. By default, you might think that the bulk orbits and edge orbits are qualitatively different. But remember, I told you that deforming the material here doesn't change the fundamental character of the edge orbit. The particle will still move along the edge of this material, okay? So what I can do is take a planar sheet like this and deform it into almost a sphere. And here's the interesting point. We had a little circular orbit at the top, and now we have a little circular orbit at the bottom, okay? And so the point is, if you think of the whole edge as sort of qualitatively a single point at infinity, if you'd like, the, 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 uh, the edge states orbit that point, while the bulk states just, you know, orbit the magnetic field at whatever local point they're at. So this is sort of your first hint that there's something topological going on here. Now, quantifying it is a little bit tricky, um, but we will, we, will, uh, we will sort of try to get to that. Okay, um, so now we can talk a little bit about um, this topological protection that, uh, that we were discussing earlier. So if uh, we look at our, our tori, your donut remains a donut 
right up until this point when you bite through it, right? And when you bite through it, the connectivity changes, the number of uh, edge, uh, edges versus surface, surfaces changes, and it becomes a sphere. So you can ask something similar about the topological protection that we get um, in, in uh, a, an electron moving along the surface of uh, a material in a magnetic field. So to understand this a little more quantitatively, um, what I've been talking about to this point is sort of semi-classical electron trajectories, right? But what we know is that if we actually have a real electron, its orbits are sort of quantized uh, in multiples, in, in energy multiples of the cyclotron frequency. Uh, and so these orbitals have some definite size, okay? And so I'm just gonna draw a fixed width kind of uh, a bump here, and we'll quantify that size uh, probably tomorrow. But, but the important point is the following. As long as the disorder that I put in doesn't couple me from one side of the system to the other, I get no backscattering. But if my disorder gets tall enough that this edge state that was going to go around actually hits the other side, now it can go backwards. So why can it now go backwards? Well, the basic point is that the orbit is right-handed here right? It's going clockwise. And along the top surface, a clockwise orbit, sorry, um, a clockwise uh, cyclotron orbit actually moves to the left, right? So if you couple the top and bottom surfaces to one another, uh, you can actually um, induce what looks like backscattering. Okay, um, now here it's a little bit more interesting because in fact, uh, this quantity isn't quite quantized. It's sort of exponential in, in, this, in the distance between uh, the lower and upper surfaces, um, but it's sort of qualitatively the same idea. Okay. Um, so, um, let's ask in, in a different way uh, why we can't backscatter. Well, the basic point is that orbits in this direction with right-handedness are allowed, and those with this left-handed counterclockwise orbit are not allowed. Uh, and, and this should feel a little bit weird to you. Why should it feel weird to you? Well, because what you are familiar with is uh, throwing balls, okay? So I have uh, two people down at the bottom of the screen. The one on the left, we can call her Alice, but there's no quantum mechanics here, right? Uh, this is just classical physics. Throws a ball to, uh, to the one on the right. Um, we can call him Bob or Harold, you know, whatever, whatever y'all like. Um, and, and so the point is this. In the absence of friction, this ball has this nice parabolic trajectory. And if we uh, instead say, well, now I want Bob to throw the ball back to Alice. So what Bob knows is if he just looks at what the velocity of the ball was when he got it, and he reverses that velocity vector, when he throws it back, the ball will go back to Alice, right? And that kind of says that the path and its time-reversed partner are both allowed given the dynamics of the system, okay? So what are some ways that one might violate this? Well, the most obvious way to violate this is to include friction because then when the ball gets to Bob, it's slowed down a little bit. So if he throws it back with the speed he got it at, it won't even make it back to Alice, right? But, uh, but, but that's lossy. And we would eventually like to understand uh, unitary dynamics and quantum mechanical systems, okay? So we don't really want loss. Um, and, and anyway, that's not gonna give us much intuition here. 
So let's instead imagine that Alice and Bob are in space, okay? And Alice wants to throw an electron to Bob and there's gonna be a magnetic field into the board. So the way she throws her electron to Bob is she, she instead of throwing it directly to Bob, she throws it straight up with the right velocity that the cyclotron orbit goes to Bob, okay? But here's the thing that's interesting. We are used to processes that respect time reversal, okay? So Bob expects that if he throws the ball straight up, well, it should go back to Alice. But here's the interesting point. We have V cross, uh, well, I guess the V is out of the page. V cross B applies a force to the right. And that's why when Alice threw the ball up, or the, the electron upward, it bent to the right and went to Bob. But if Bob does the same thing, of course, his ball will have the same trajectory. It'll go to the right. So the point is, he tried to time reverse this. He just reversed the velocity of his ball, but it didn't go back to Alice. Okay, it, uh, it, it instead went off in this direction. And this is the fundamental difference that, uh, that gives us this kind of uh, topological protection against backscattering uh, for electrons. Okay, that uh, essentially we have a force on the electron which is proportional to its velocity. And all forces that are proportional to velocity break time reversal symmetry. Okay, there are two types of such forces. There are frictional ones, if the force is just directly proportional to the velocity, and then the rate of change of the amount of energy in the system, of course, is always the force dotted into the velocity. And so that's just gonna be a number. And so uh, the energy in the system is gonna continuously drop. The interesting point uh, is that if instead the force is proportional to the velocity, but uh, you know, the cross product of the velocity with some number, or if you prefer, you could write beta as a matrix, right? And the force is a matrix times the velocity. So it's still proportional to the velocity, but with this kind of tensor relationship connecting them. Well, now we have the change in energy is the force dot the velocity, but the force is beta across the velocity, which is, per which is perpendicular to beta and the velocity. So when I dot that into the velocity, I get zero, okay? Which means that in fact, I have a force which is proportional to my velocity, but which does not absorb energy. So this should feel uh, very strange to you. Um, and, and this is essentially the fundamental origin of the, of the kind of protection that one gets uh, in the quantum Hall effect. Let me also mention there are a number of related topics that are uh, very hot right now. I don't know if any of you have heard of the term Hall viscosity, okay? Uh, or excuse me, uh, yeah, or Hall drag. Uh, and, and, and these kinds of ideas are about, um, you know, viscosity tells you something about the force on a, a substance, uh, a liquid being related to the gradient of the velocity. So if I have a, a wall here and the velocity is slow close to the wall and faster further from the wall, then I get a drag force, which is proportional to that gradient in the velocity, right? And that's a dissipative force. But if I have a drag force, which is proportional to the gradient in the velocity, but it's proportional with a cross product, then that force will be perpendicular to the surface and it won't lead to any damping, but it still breaks time reversal symmetry in some interesting ways, okay? And again, to generate these kinds of forces, you need magnetic fields because you need something that breaks time reversal symmetry. Okay? Now, let me say magnetic fields are one example of something which breaks time reversal symmetry, but they are in fact not the only one. Okay? And the basic point is you have to be careful about what is your system uh, and, uh, and, and what laws of physics you keep constant in the following sense. How did I generate my magnetic field?
because what Alice and Bob did when Bob received the ball, he tried to just reverse its velocity and throw it back to Alice, right? And in a magnetic field, that doesn't work. But if he had also reversed the current in the electromagnet generating the magnetic field, right, then the magnetic field would also have reversed and he could have thrown the ball straight up or the electron straight up and it would have gone back to Alice, right? So the fundamental point here is that you need something that breaks time reversal symmetry that you don't reverse when you try to reverse the dynamics. Okay, and so for those of you who have thought at all about uh, cold atom experiments, where modulating a lattice generates a magnetic, uh, an effective magnetic field on the cold atoms, there the point is that that breaks time reversal symmetry in the sense that when the atom backscatters, the phases of those modulations don't reverse, right? This is an external thing which we as experimentalists are keeping fixed, right? And, and that's uh, fundamentally what, uh, what breaks your time reversal. And so as we'll see on Wednesday, Coriolis is another example of something that breaks time reversal symmetry. So what you should have in mind here is two people playing ping pong um, on, and, and they're, the table and the people are standing on a rotating platform, okay? And so, the picture you should now have in mind, you ask yourself, if, if I receive the ball and it comes to my paddle and I try to hit it straight back along the path that I received it on, will it go back to my opponent, right? Well, on a non-rotating table, it certainly will. Well, modulo spin. I know you all are hot shots. Is there a ping pong table at Lesus or just, uh, just pool? But, but ping pong you should be able to use. You can just bring it outside, right? That's a great socially distanced sport. If there's one thing that I can do, that's going to be my contribution. I'm not saying another word until the ping pong table is outside. Okay. Uh, of course, all I can see is this room, so you could just tell me it's outside. Um, but... Uh, yeah, so this is sort of the fundamental trick that we always use as experimentalists. We add some external thing, either a magnetic field or modulation or rotation or something that effectively breaks time reversal symmetry for us. Okay. Um, so we're going to be talking uh, tomorrow and Wednesday about several different model systems made of either optical or microwave photons uh, where one can explore topological physics. That is to say, make photons behave like um, uh, electrons uh, in magnetic fields uh, or other sort of more exotic topological things as well. Uh, and so part of the story there is going to be about building an understanding of what those models are actually about by looking at how to build them with uh, optical or microwave photons, okay? But uh, I think a really important thing for us to do first is to sort of write down what these models look like for uh, just in a vacuum, right, for, for electrons. Uh, so that we know what kinds of terms we're going to need to generate uh, for our photons, okay? So the sort of two places where you might think about studying uh, uh, electrons in magnetic fields are either in free space, kind of in a continuum, where you can write the Hamiltonian as just P minus EA squared, okay? Um, where A is a vector potential that... Uh, is just given by B cross R, okay? Uh, and if you look at the semi-classical dynamics under a, uh, uh, a Hamiltonian like this, you just get a Lorentz force, okay? The other th place you might try to study this is uh, for an electron in uh, 
in a solid, for example, a 2D electron gas. And in practice, that's usually where one studies electrons, uh, because otherwise they move around in the third direction when you try to let them interact with each other. And that makes things quite messy. Okay, so the point is that uh, in a lattice, the, the model looks like this, okay? There's some tunneling between adjacent sites, site uh, I and J, I is an index in the X direction, J is an index in the Y direction. So this says an electron uh, is taken from, uh, from state I plus one J and moved to site IJ. So it moves one site uh, sort of to the right uh, and it accrues some phase theta x of ij, right? And uh, it can also move one site down and accrue a phase theta y at ij, uh, or it can go up and back. So time reversal, or excuse me, unitarity, that is to say the fact that there's no damping in the system, says that there has to be a Hermitian conjugate here, okay? So if we were allowing for friction, the other two terms could have different sizes, they could be, uh, have different phases. Uh, but of course, if you're really allowing for friction, then you can't really use a Hamiltonian, the thing is a mess. So no friction, one can still break time reversal symmetry, okay, by having theta ij of x and theta ij of y vary in space in the correct way, okay? Um, and so what you should have in mind here is that uh, theta at site MN uh, of X is basically the integral from site uh, MN to site MN plus one of the vector potential. Uh, well, I mean, it's just the line integral of the vector potential from one site to the next, okay? Um, but as long as we integrate directly along that line, it's just AX. Um, and that is to say, it's basically the aharonov bohm phase that one acquires in moving from site uh, MN to M plus one N, okay? And, and this, I think, is actually a pretty subtle and interesting fact. The basic point is that when you have particles hopping in a lattice, which is just these... Uh, creation and annihilation operators, uh, all of the physics of the magnetic field, the Lorentz forces, everything, is contained in the Aharonov bohm phase that you accrue in hopping from one site to the next. Now, let me emphasize, I have not proven that here, right? I'm stating it without proof. Uh, to prove it, the basic game is to uh, take the limit that uh, the spacing between your lattice sites becomes very small. And then your lattice system should look just like a continuum system. And, uh, and you'll get back the continuum result. But let's just take a moment and uh, write out this Hamiltonian for a constant magnetic field pointing into the board, okay? The point is now we get this Harper-Hofstetter Hamiltonian, okay? Um, and what I'd like to do is just walk you quickly through how you should think about this Hamiltonian, okay? So the idea is, um, and I've chosen a particular gauge here. You probably don't remember gauges from classical electromagnetism. I certainly didn't um, when I first got into this stuff, but uh, I'm just giving you the words for now, okay? The point is I can hop and this, these T's are Hermitian conjugates. This particular slide was made in an earlier day when you couldn't uh, insert LaTeX directly into Keynote. So uh, you get a little bit of jankiness here. So I apologize for that. Um, this takes a particle from uh, site mu nu plus one, that is to say one site up, and tunnels it down by one site with no phase accrued, right? And similarly, you can tunnel, uh, up one site. Well, this one, I guess, is up one site. This one is down one site with no phase accrued, okay? But when I tunnel in the X direction, I accrue a phase which is linear in my Y coordinate. Okay, think about that. I can tunnel in the Y direction 
and I get no phase on any of these vertical links. But the amount of phase that I get when I tunnel in the x direction depends upon y. So the point is in this first row, I accrue zero phase. In this second row, I accrue a phase alpha. In the third row, I accrue a phase two alpha, three alpha, four alpha, so forth. So let's look at what happens when I tunnel around a little loop like this. Well, the point is when I hop downwards, I accrue zero phase. When I hop to the right, I accrue a phase. If this site is mu nu, right, then when I go down a row, it's nu plus one. So I accrue a phase of alpha, that's this alpha, times nu plus one. Then when I tunnel back up, I accrue no phase. And when I tunnel back to the left, I accrue a phase of minus alpha nu. So this gives me a total phase when I hop around this loop of alpha. Okay? And that is precisely the Aharonov Bohm phase that I should acquire when I hop around a loop like this, or when I adiabatically move a particle around a loop like this uh, in the presence of a magnetic field of, what is it? B L squared times two E squared over H, right? And so what we usually do for describing this physics, instead of talking about the magnetic field, we instead talk about alpha, okay? Because the point is, if I tell you what the magnetic field is, then you need to know the spacing between my lattice sites, right? But the point is that fundamentally, the only thing that matters for uh, understanding the behavior of the particle in the lattice is alpha, right? The actual magnetic field is a unitful quantity. Alpha is a unit less quantity, okay? So we will work with alpha going forward instead of the magnetic field, right? Because that makes us sort of indifferent to whether we're talking about electrons in a magnetic field in some tiny lattice, right, with a with this, with a big field or electrons in, in a magnetic field, in a small field, in a large spacing lattice, uh, or some other particle that obeys the same Hamiltonian. And what we will talk about tomorrow is how to realize this Hamiltonian for photons, right? There may or may not actually be a magnetic field. We just have to create these phases, okay? Um, now, one more point. What does this have to do really at a fundamental level with Aharonov Bohm phases? Well, the fundamental point is that I have made the assumption that this lattice is in a tight binding regime. Has everyone taken solid state physics? Raise your hand if you have taken solid state physics. Looks like most of you, okay. I can't really see, you're each about two pixels. So uh, I should really implement some kind of an error correcting code. We could give you each like a little blue, uh, green and red sign that you could hold up or something. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, the, the point is that we wanna make sure the magnetic field is not so strong that it mixes the on-site orbitals, okay? And as long as the magnetic field isn't strong enough to mix the on-site orbitals, we're in a limit where we can really think of the, the dynamics of the electron as sort of adiabatic within the lowest band uh, of the lattice in the presence of this magnetic field. And, and that's why the, the Aharonov Bohm phase gives us everything. Okay, so let's spend a moment now and try to think about solving this model. Okay, so we can draw this out. All of the vertical hoppings have zero phase. The horizontal ones have zero alpha, two alpha, three alpha, so forth. Okay, so here's the interesting thing. We would like to diagonalize this model and figure out the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And uh, this is called the Hofstetter model. There's a wonderful paper, I think from 1979, demonstrating how to do this in closed form. But the fundamental point is the following. I need to think about alpha's value, okay? If alpha is an integer, uh, is two pi times some ratio of integers, p over q, okay? 
then the point is that this theta value, the hopping in the x direction, repeats every q rows. We're assuming that p over q are relatively prime. Otherwise, I could reduce the fraction. Okay. So the point is it repeats every q rows because this is then going to be a multiple of 2 pi, so it may as well be 0 again. Okay. Uh, and, and this is important because now I can think of one column and q rows as being the effective unit cell of my system. Okay, and I can apply Bloch's theorem. That is to say, assume that I have a wave function with, say, say q is five. So every five, I, I take five lattice sites in one direction, one lattice site in the other. I have effectively like a five element spinner. And the next row over is the same times e to the i phi x. Okay, and the next five sites down are the same times e to the i phi y, and then I can solve this model uh, and, and, and compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. But here's the neat thing. We can already see that because there are q elements in this, I, in this uh, vector, there will be q potentially different eigenvalues. Okay, And so what that means is that my band structure is going to have q different bands. But now you should be really uncomfortable because what that says is that if alpha is, ra is a rational fraction of 2 pi, then I get a finite number of bands, right? But if alpha is not a rational fraction of 2 pi, I get an infinite number of bands. That is to say, this thing never repeats. And so I just... You know, I, uh, I, the, the, the eigenstates aren't even distributed in bands. And so, in fact, if you look at this spectrum, this is the famous Hofstadter butterfly. And now we understand how to think about this object. The point is that the x-axis here tells you alpha over 2 pi, okay? And when that's a rational number, we get these nice, clean, simple things. When it's one half, we get one band here and another band there. When alpha is a quarter, we get one band, two bands, three bands, four bands, right? But man, when alpha is in between those rational numbers, we get an infinite number of bands, okay? And so this is sort of the simplest fractal, fractal band structure. But the point is that there's really no magic here. If you want to realize this in a physical system, right, to see that the band structure is a fractal, well, you need to have a system that's so huge, right, that, uh, that you can see that alpha is not rational, right? So you'd have to make your system infinitely large, fundamentally. Um, but, but, but anyway, this should give you a flavor of, uh, of where that physics is coming from. Um, so I'd like to speak just very briefly um, about how we should think about particles uh, behaving in lattices, okay? Uh, and I know I'm supposed to try to keep this to an hour, so I will, uh, I'll be fairly brief on this one. Um, so let's just think about alpha equals zero, no flux through the lattice. So we can factorize into x and y dynamics. They're not coupled to one another anymore. Let's just think about x, okay? So the point is now my particle can hop in the x direction, and all of those hoppings are the same, okay? And uh, so we can diagonalize this model um, and what I get is uh, creation operators uh, with uh, quasi-momenta Q. That is to say, the, I create a superposition of particles at different lattice sites with relative phase uh, Q. Okay? And if I just plug this into that Hamiltonian, what I find is that the energy of that state, well, I dropped a term. Well, here, this is actually minus 2T cosine Q or minus 2T plus TQ squared, approximately. So why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because I can write Q is KA, where A is the lattice spacing, which is PA over H bar. Uh, sorry, this should say A. Um, and now I can write this whole thing as the energy at momentum Q is minus 2T plus P squared over 2M tilde, where M tilde is H bar squared over 2TA squared. Okay, and so this is to say that 
essentially, as long as you keep the quasi-momentum of the particles low, that is to say, the phase between lattice sites is small compared to pi, such that the atoms can't even really see that they're in a lattice, they just feel like they're in some continuum, um, then the particle has a quadratic dispersion, right? Its energy is, uh, is quadratic in its momentum. But the point is the coefficient is some renormalized mass due to the lattice, okay? Uh, and so what this means is that if I apply forces to it, um, it's gonna respond, it's gonna accelerate and so forth uh, like uh, uh, um, an electron with some other mass. Uh, and so the question you might ask is, is this generic? Um, uh, or is there potentially more going on in, in, a, in some lattice with arbitrary connectivity and arbitrary Aharonov bohm phases and so on and so forth, okay? So proving the answer is a little bit tricky, but uh, let me just write down the answer in general for you. It's these two equations here, okay? Uh, the first equation is more or less what you expect. So these are the semi-classical equations of motion for a wave packet um, that's fairly, fairly narrow spectrally living in a lattice, okay? And what we see is that the rate of change of the expectant value of the quasi-momentum is essentially proportional to whatever electric field I apply to the particle, okay? Plus a, uh, a Lorentz force, which is proportional to both the velocity and uh, the local magnetic field. Okay, that's more or less what we would have expected, okay? The second equation looks totally crazy, um, but it turns out it's not actually that crazy, okay? The point is the rate of change of the position of the particle, well, what we're used to is that the rate of change of position is essentially the momentum uh, divided by the mass, right? But we get these two crazy terms. Well, let's look at the first term. Well, the point is that if the energy goes like the momentum squared, right, as we kind of approximated it on the previous slide, this is going to be something which is proportional to the momentum. So that's great. It just worked out, right? Um, if we have a more complicated energy momentum relation, we get something that looks crazier. And that's just saying that fundamentally, the group velocity of the particle, right, the rate at which the wave packet moves is the gradient of the energy with respect to the momentum. And that's just our normal definition of the group velocity. That's nothing new. It's this second term that's totally wild, okay? This is a term that looks like a Lorentz force, right? But it's a Lorentz force in momentum space, right? That is to say, the rate of change of the position is proportional to the cross product of the momentum with some quantity, which I'll call omega. It's the Berry curvature here, okay? And this second term comes about because these eigenvectors can actually vary with your momentum, okay? And if the eigenvector varies with momentum in a non-trivial way, then essentially you have what looks like a non-adiabatic term in your Hamiltonian that you have to include and correct for, okay? So, uh, and, and incidentally, these ends are just a band index. So the question is, which band does my particle live in, right, in my lattice? Um, so we would like to know what that omega quantity is. Um, it's called uh, the Berry curvature, and we write it in terms of uh, the Berry connection called A. It's basically a vector potential, okay? It's uh, the gradient of the uh, wave function with respect to Q, with respect to the quasi-momentum dotted into the wave function at that same quasi-momentum. And then we can write a, uh, this uh, Berry curvature as uh, the curl of that with respect to Q, okay? Um, and, and we call this a curvature, and um, it provides this, this weird looking force, okay? 
Um, and, and the fundamental final result here is that the churn number, which sort of controls the existence or absence of edge states in the system, uh, is the integral of the Berry curvature over the brill one zone, okay? And the bulk boundary correspondence uh, states that the number of chiral edge modes, that is to say the difference between the number of right and left movers, uh, residing energetically between two bands uh, and in space uh, between uh, two different regions with uh, different Hamiltonians is given by the difference in the churn number of the two regions, okay? Um, so again, these are stated without proof. And what I would like to do is show you how some of this works tomorrow when we hop back to talking about uh, circuit models and how to physically realize these ideas um, in, uh, in, in uh, either LC circuits or in um, arrays of superconducting resonators. I'd like to make a br a, two broad points here um, before we uh, chat a little bit and take questions and close, okay? So the first um, broad point is that everything I have told you today is about properties of waves, okay? We think about it in terms of bras and kets because when we talk about electrons, well, we think about electron waves as being somehow fundamentally quantum mechanical, right? Because we think of the Schrodinger equation as being fundamentally quantum mechanical. But the real point here, and what we're gonna harness until we start adding electrons between our, par our interactions, sorry, between our par particles, which we will do, is that all of this stuff just relies on having a wave equation that, uh, either lives on a lattice or lives in a continuum and has eigenvectors and eigenvalues that obey these kinds of relations, okay? And so you can realize that with electrons, you can realize it with cold atoms and optical lattices, and there you still think of it as quantum mechanical because you don't normally think of cold atoms as behaving like waves, right? We think of matter as behaving like particles. I don't know that that's necessarily right. It's, I mean, one's no more quantum mechanical than the other. But uh, when we do it with photons, it will feel totally natural that we get a wave equation for classical light, right? And so it becomes very, very easy to understand these ideas without interactions anyway for uh, classical electromagnetic fields. And so that's what we're going to do first before we add interactions into the story, okay? The other point I would like to make um, is that vector potentials, we think of as being something that's totally magical, okay? But if people are interested, um, we can chat. Um, hopefully there'll be a little bit of time at the end tomorrow. You can tell me if you're interested in this. We can talk about vector potentials in, in terms of either thermodynamics, or in terms of cats, okay? Where the fundamental point is all a vector potential is, is something that tells you that uh, the value of some quantity that you're interested in depends on the path that you take through your system or, or through parameter space, okay? And so the point is when we talk about a Carnot cycle for an engine, okay, fundamentally, the engine undergoes a loop. It comes back to where it started, right? But it did some work in getting there, right? So there is a vector potential associated with that. Similarly, you can think about how does a cat rotate to land on its feet, okay? Thinking about this in 3D is very confusing, but you can alternatively think of sort of a minimal cat as... Uh, being a double hinged object. So I'm gonna do it with two scissors because cats have sharp teeth, okay? Um, and so the point is this, your cat can actuate this hinge and it can actuate that hinge, sorry, that hinge, okay? And that's all it can do. 
So the question you should ask yourself is, just by actuating those two hinges, can a cat on a frictionless surface rotate itself? Okay, and it turns out the answer is yes. And you can write a vector potential in this angle, theta one, and that angle, theta two. And then the point is you get some A of theta one and theta two. And as you take some path through theta one, theta two space, that A integrating it along your curve tells you how much the cat has rotated. So you can go through theta one, theta two space back to where you started, right? And effectively the area enclosed is how much your cat rotated. Okay, and so this is just a vector potential. And the point is that all of this stuff is just about holonomics. Okay, um, so on that note, uh, I was going to talk a little about anions today. I think the anion discussion actually goes better uh, with fractional quantum hall on Wednesday. So on that note, I think we're right on time. But uh, does anyone have any questions, anything that you'd like to talk about? Um, this is, this is an interesting thing. So we have to go back. Um, let's, let's look at our donuts a little bit more. Okay. Um, we have to be a little careful when I ask, is something or isn't it a donut? What I'm really asking is for an object where the object is a closed surface. Okay. I don't care about the volume inside of it. Yeah? I just care about the closed surface. And the question is, does that have a hole? Okay, so maybe I wasn't clear about the definition of a hole. When I say a hole, what I really mean is something that I can reach through and touch my fingers together, right? Uh, and so you could ask about topological classification of compact three-dimensional bodies. Right, but what I'm uh, trying to describe, and in, in slightly hand wavy terms here, is topological classification of compact two dimensional surfaces potentially embedded in three dimensional space. Does that distinction make sense? But let me also say um, the embedding actually isn't that important. Okay. Um, you can imagine, let me find a sheet of paper. This is how you know that uh, we've, we've entered the future. I literally don't have a sheet of paper. Maybe I have a tax document or something, hold on. So I have an envelope. I use these envelopes once a year to send my taxes in, okay? So here's the point. Is this sheet of paper equivalent to a torus? Well, if I identify this edge and that edge, and this edge and that edge, it's equivalent to a torus, right? It has no curvature anywhere. But what I've said is that when I leave this edge, I reappear over there. And when I leave, leave this edge, I reappear down there, okay? But again, a torus, you're supposed to integrate the curvature over the whole surface and you get zero. Perfect, no problem, right? So this piece of paper if you assume that when you leave one edge, you come back in on the other, is equivalent uh, to a torus. And indeed, you know, it's hard to make that because, you know, you can't make something with local curvature out of a sheet of paper, but, but it is topologically equivalent to a torus. But the point is that I cannot make a sphere out of a sheet of paper, right? Because for a sphere, I identify these two edges, but then I need to identify all of the points along this edge with one another, right? And, and the point is, 
you can't do that without scrunching the sheet of paper. And so this is one way you can identify whether a surface has Gaussian curvature, right? Uh, can you make it out of a sheet of paper? So for example, does, does the cone have Gaussian curvature? That's right. Exactly right. The point is I can make it out of the sheet of paper because I can cheat. It's only this one point. Everywhere else actually has no curvature. The tip has curvature, but there's actually no paper exactly at the tip. Right? Um, and so uh, anyway, um, one could imagine making something that's topologically equivalent to a sphere from kind of two cones. And then there's curvature at the two tips and curvature at the point where they meet. Um, and and you, can, you can add up the answers that way. And that's also why this polyhedron story uh, works out the way it does. The point is that somehow topology is really about connectivity, net connectivity over your whole surface. Um, I know this is straight a little bit away from the initial question, but, but somehow we're really talking to come back to it about 2D surfaces embedded in three space not about the topology of, of, of 3D objects. Is it, is it, is it beer and poster time? And, and you're going to bring me around on the computer to see everybody, right? All right, see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.